Uh, You're in. Hi there. There you go. <laughs> and that's Gunther. Hi, Gunther. <laughs> Bring it here. Hi, Tina. Good to see you. Um, Tina, you're muted. So there's a button here. Maybe I can hit this button to ask to unmute you. You. Yeah, there, there we go. go. You're unmuted now. There we go. <laughs> I thought it was off. It didn't work. Hi, everybody. Okay, yeah, I'm going to wait like, you know, three more minutes or something, and then we'll just start. Sounds good. Uh, let me look at the lobby here to yeah, make sure that everyone that wants to join can. Hmm, let's see. I sent out a few reminders, but I didn't get any response back, so we'll see. No, it's a, I did as well, you know, so. Good. Oh, we got somebody. Now I'm intrigued. Who's who's uh, stealthy enough to use the word invisible as their name? I don't know. <clears throat> You'd have to ask him. <laughs> invisible. Interesting. Some, some people would rather be anonymous. That's okay. Well, I, I always love when you go to search for a network and one on there is FBI surveillance. Yeah. Like, yeah. Let me <laughs> let me pick that one. Yeah, that's a funny. Yeah, it's a funny joke. I've seen that one before. I've seen that one a few times. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I'm gonna wait till six oh five, and then we'll start. Yeah. Being and, precise and, today. That's amazing. Well, and, and again, I'm going to, I'm probably going to post this on our page just so that like, if people weren't able to attend the meeting, they could at least see um, what was said and then they can comment on it, you know, um, if they want to comment on something that maybe wasn't mentioned in the meeting, because, um, yeah, but I did, I did send out invites to everyone in the neighborhood on the, on the list, mailing list, and, um, you know, we welcome all of them. So uh, it's 6.05, so we're just going to start. So uh, hey, everybody uh, who, who is able to attend this meeting. Um, this is a, a community meeting held by um, Homes Now, Not Later, our organization. Uh, Homes Now has, was established in 2017 with the goal of ending homelessness one person at a time. Um, over the years, we've been able to work with the city of Bellingham to set up multiple um, tiny home villages in the city of Bellingham. Um, Unity Village, which was established in August of 2019, and Swift Haven Tiny Home Community, which was established in December of 2020, or January of 2020. I forget if it was late December or early January. Um, we have been um, able to operate um, both of our villages successfully over the course of the years. Um, but for various reasons for both sites, um, the, it has been slated that they have to be moved to um, another location. So, um, in the process of in the process of trying to um, come up with locations to move the villages to, um, uh, we applied for a temporary shelter permit uh, with the city of Bellingham for the thirty three hundred Northwest location, which is located in the Birchwood neighborhood. Um, this meeting is optional, but we felt it was necessary to do um, to uh, inform the neighborhood uh, that we expressed interest in having the site be a site that 
would be good for a relocation of, of both villages too. Um, we would rather that it was a third new village rather than a relocation, but we also understand the reasons behind it having to be a relocation from the city side. So, for example, at Unity Village, which operates in Fairhaven, um, the, I guess the sewer treatment plant is going to need to expand in a few years. Uh, to there's work that needs to be done on that site for that at some point and it's also reaching the five-year limit uh, in accordance with the current municipal code which states that there can be a two-year um, permit with the option for uh, three subsequent one-year extensions and so um, we are getting close to the five-year mark at unity village at Swift Haven, um, it is currently in the parking lot of a baseball field, and uh, one uh, of the Frank Jerry Fields. And um, I guess the explanation for why that one has to move is because of um, uh, at the state level, there's some, there's a grant or or uh, terms for the use of the facilities of the baseball field, um, the parking lot of the baseball field in that it has to be used for recreation um, and not specifically like a, a housing or shelter or a tiny home village. And um, I guess at the state level that has been extended up to this point, but the, the, it is going to have to come to an end um, according to what we've been told. So um, the idea was that both villages would be moved to this new location with some upgraded amenities compared to what we got now. So for example, flushing toilets and uh, and shower we had showers and we have showers at both of our villages but um the the there's going to be a shower slash toilet trailer that has three full bathrooms in it so to speak um and then a couple extra porter potties in case that is not enough capacity um currently at both of our villages we use porter potties for the um for the uh toilets um and then um we we do have facilities for like laundry and um kitchen and stuff like that uh which we're hoping that or we it seems like is going to be upgraded at this new site so when we move to this new site instead of being like a kitchen tent or a laundry tent it's going to be enclosed <clears throat> modular structures so that'll be really good for like in the winter or the extreme winter or the extreme summer to keep like food um away from like you know pest management and stuff like that to avoid like rats and other things like that, which we've dealt with it, but like it's a thing when you have like an open like kitchen tent, you know, it's the elements are a thing as well as um, attracting animals and stuff. So when we have enclosed structures, that'll be a lot nicer. Um, but I just wanted to say that like um, we've been doing this for a number of years. It's not like we have no track record or we haven't done this before. Um, Homes Now has successfully managed uh, two tiny home villages in Bellingham. Um, and I do have some numbers that I'd like to share just so that like whoever is on the call can kind of like look at the numbers. Um, so the, the, we update these numbers, you know, on a regular basis. This, the, these numbers include, uh, this is exit results, right? So these numbers do not include people that, um, currently live at the village and uh and let me share my screen so people can see one second i was doing it on my other screen but i realized i didn't share my screen one second um oh, oh yeah this one okay so you guys can see my screen right okay so we got our numbers here um you know, we have like demographic information. So this, this is like when, when people, uh, leave the village. So the number, these numbers do not include people that are currently still living at the village. It, it includes exits. So b basically once somebody leaves, what are the numbers? Um, and this is since we've been in operation <clears throat> since 2019 uh, or we've been in operation before 2019 because tw in 2019 we had, um, our first village but before that we were a regulated tent encampment basically um so that's still in here we just go back all the way to the beginning um uh so um 
so we have about a 50% rehousing rate. So between both of our villages combined, about 51% um, gets into housing, you know, or long-term stable housing. I don't want to use the term permanent because um, anybody here, including myself, where when has where you've lived been totally permanent? Like you might live somewhere in a stable long-term way for multiple years, but it might not be permanent, but we've been able to get, um, we have about a 51% rehousing rate um, between both of our village or 50.3%. Uh, Unity Village is a little higher um, at around 58%, 57%. Um, Swift Haven's around 43%. Um, I will add that uh, Swift Haven is younger. Um, Unity Village has been around for almost five years. Swift Haven's been around for almost three and a half years. Um, and when Unity Village was three and a half years, it had a similar rate of around 42 point whatever. It, it, it ends up going gradually going up over time for both villages. Um, the average length of stay, you know, is it, it tends to be like three months to a year, so to speak like the biggest chunk. Um, some people have been with us for a few years. Some people have been with us for just a few weeks and then they were able to move out and find housing and um, stuff like that. Um, basically, uh, we are hoping to uh, make sure that this village that's set up in the Birchwood neighborhood is a positive impact on, on the um, community. Um, we. The one thing that is kind of unusual about our model compared to a lot of other models is that we are all volunteer with no paid staff. I'm the chairman, I'm not paid. Um, nobody at Homes Now is paid. Um, the And the volunteers are mostly um, the residents themselves, the people who live at the village who are homeless, who need a place to live. And um, they are willing to do chores and do the jobs required on, the, on site, such as cleaning, such as front desk, um, uh, to keep the place operating smoothly and efficiently. Um, so we haven't had to actually have a, um, like a full-time paid staff situation um, for our model. Our model, of course, doesn't work for everyone, but it does work for what I would describe as about 70% of the homeless population would do okay, would do well at our, um, at our villages. Um, so... Uh, We've been doing this for years. We get, we get, I know it was mentioned in a couple of emails about police calls. We've actually gotten very, very few police calls, almost none. Um, I'd say in the last year, it's probably fewer than three in, or three or four in the last year. And typically the calls are not due to internal problems, but some kind of like external um, intruder or something to that effect where it's, you know, like a reasonable situation that anybody would call the police over or a, a medical emergency. Somebody had a heart attack or somebody had a um, like medical um, situation and that's when we would call. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the records are at the city level, but I can say that as far as I'm aware, we have had very few um, police calls at either of our villages. Um, I'm just mentioning this because it was mentioned to me in an email, so I just wanted to uh, be upfront about it and mention that. Um, we are, I don't know, I just want to say we, we wanted to hold this meeting so that like, if anybody had any questions or concerns or um, potential issues that they might be foreseeing, um, that they could express that and that we could answer those questions head on and um, and move in a better direction. So is there anybody here that that has questions? Yeah, Doug, if I could interject just really briefly on that topic of questions or answering, um, yeah, any concerns or questions. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Sarah Ullman. I'm a city planner here at the city. Doug did a great introduction talking about Homes Now as an agency and the project scope. I just wanted to put on the regulatory hat and explain the permit process and opportunities for public comment and where to find some of these materials. Um, so as Doug explained, 
um, the project scope is to relocate both these existing villages to the new proposed site off of Northwest Ave. Um, I wanted to let you all know that a permit for a temporary shelter permit and a SEPA environmental review, those have been submitted. They were applied for at the, the tail end of May. Um, the city issued a public notice and if you are a property owner within 500 feet, you should have received a public notice in the mail explaining what the project was and how to comment. So right now the public comment period, it is open. It stays open for 14 days. And so it closes next Friday, which is the 21st of June. Public comments can be received only in writing so you can either email them to permits at cob.org or to me, or you can snail mail them or drop them off at the permit center. A quick note on what Doug said about posting the neighborhood meeting to the Homes Now webpage. That's great. We love transparency. We love getting information out there. But from the city's perspective, for me to consider a public comment, a public comment for the record, it needs to be submitted to the city. So the city won't accept comments that are made on the Homes Now webpage, just as an FYI. But if you just want to have that correspondence or dialogue with Homes Now and get those questions answered, that's great. That's super. Um, a little bit about temporary shelter permits within the city of Bellingham. Um, we have a whole co code chapter devoted to the, this. It's chapter 2015 of city code. And it was passed like five or six years ago. So there are a lot of regulations that operators need to comply with. Um, and we are reviewing the permit application for compliance with those rules and in fact, when we do the public notice, we issue draft permit conditions, and those are going to be posted online this week. Um, those kind of draft permit conditions to mitigate impacts, etc. Um, all of these application materials that Homes Now has submitted, it is available and viewable on the city's webpage, and we also have an informational webpage devoted to what is called the North Haven Village. That's what we're calling it. Um, so you'll be able to find all of these resources online. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to Doug or myself. Um, a quick note, if, if y'all could include your name and contact information in the chat and Doug can assemble that, I like to get um, just a, a sign-in sheet for these neighborhood meetings so that if you'd like, you can be included as a party of record which means you'll get a notice of the decision once it is made. Um, so if you could, if you have a, a minute, just put your name and contact information in the chat so that Doug can assemble that and get it to me. Um, but other than that, this is kind of Homes Now's meeting. I'm just a wallflower. If anybody has questions about regulations, city code, process, opportunity to comment, just let me know. Again, my, my name is Sarah Ullman and I will put my contact in the chat and hand it back over to Doug. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, so I, I was gonna open it up to like any questions or any concerns or any potential like just dialogue if anybody who's here wants to ask a question or, or present something that they'd like some feedback on. So is there anybody here that would like to say something or would like to ask a question or anything like that about it? Positive or negative, it doesn't matter. We're happy to answer anything. This is Perry Eskridge. I've got some questions, but I'm busy typing in the chat right now. So okay. Okay. I'll be back. Okay, sounds good. I also do see we have some people from the villages themselves who are on the chat so that's cool yeah hi samuel hi jason um hi guys <clears throat> glad you know uh, that tv didn't work out so i'm just in my yeah it's all good i tried to send the link to everybody so they could tap on it if they wanted to join it or whatever yeah like technical issues pop up uh pretty easily i guess i'd say <laughs> when trying to do stuff like that Okay. Um, 
Well, yeah, I just wanted to say that for anybody who's here who has not actually, um, oh, thank you. For anybody here though who has not actually like um, seen any of our villages, like um, we are open to the public. So um, you are free to come by anytime you want. Um, during regular business hours is the best time to come. And usually on like sunnier days, like if it's not like really rainy and gross, is when people are out and about a little more and, and are able to chit chat a little more. So just, but you, you don't have to like announce when you're coming or anything. It's nice if we know so that we know that you're coming. Um, but like at the same time, uh, we're an open book and we're proud of what we built at both places. And, um, and you're, and again, this isn't like a new experiment. We've done, we've been already doing this. And, um, if you'd like to come down and check it out for yourself, um, unscripted, then, Go for it, and uh, we welcome your we welcome you. So, um, I, if there's any questions at all, like I'm happy to answer them. Um, there's a lot of details on this type of stuff. Like you know, sometimes people have questions of like, what are the rules or regulations of living at the village? How what's your application process like? Um, you know, just a few ideas of questions if, if people have them. Um, we're happy to answer anything. Um, yeah, Doug, I have a question. Yeah. Can you tell us more about how parking works, both for the residents and for visitors? Yes. Um, so uh, parking at both of our villages, um, we do have parking. Uh, uh, we have parking at, at Swift Haven. We don't have a lot of parking spots, like designated parking spots, but the site is wide enough where it's kind of like a big hallway. And um, there's enough space between the houses that if somebody has a vehicle, they can kind of park right in front of their house um, and it doesn't block like the fire lane or anything like that. Um, at Unity Village, there is parking um, outside of the, the site um, that is a number of spots. I don't know the exact number of spots, but it might be like 10 spots or, or something like that or eight spots or something like that. Um, and since it's a tight layout at Unity Village, there's not really any parking uh, inside. Uh, at the North Haven site, it looked like from the site layout, which, you know, I could show you the site layout like that we've got. Like, you know, I, I think that would be good to show uh, one second. Uh, this is a preliminary site layout. You guys can see my screen, right? So... We've got a preliminary layout here where we've got kind of like the kitchen, kitchens and the um, facilities like laundry and, and showers and stuff like kind of it's central with a bigger like courtyard area like here. Um, this currently this area down here is currently um, like kind of like a ditch and I guess it's going to get filled with gravel or whatever. So this will be a spot we can use. Um, and uh, we do have two, three, four, five, six, seven, about seven parking spots, um, which is a little bit tight, but um, uh, people have been informed at both of our villages that if there isn't enough parking, that there is street parking and not, not parking at the, you know, bank parking lot, but street parking like about a block away and that they can use that. Um, and then perhaps if there's enough room and we've got somebody that might be like ADA, for example, that has a vehicle. There might be there might be some unofficial way to park them right next to their ADA unit if there's they're not blocking anything, but probably not. Um, so we do have a designated spot for ADA or handicap parking for people who might have that uh, a vehicle and they need to be close to the unit that is ADA. Uh, so like that's how the parking is going to kind of work at the new site as far as the layout is concerned. Um, but I also wanted to explain how it it currently works at um, at the current sites that we've got. So at the, at the at the North Haven uh, location, you're going to house 52 residents. Uh, it looks like it's going to be about 48, but I think the number is 52 for maximum flex capacity like if you know because these these things are all very detailed documents so i think there's a little bit more than the i think it was going to be 48 units but 
the number of people that are allowed to live there is 52. Let's say it's a couple or something and there's some kind of situation where that would make sense for two people to be in one unit. Although we typically try to keep it one person per unit, so it'll likely be 48, but the documentation has a maximum of 52 in case there's some kind of like extra flex capacity we might be able to um, implement. Okay, so, so for 48 residents, you've got seven parking spaces. Uh, in, in your other villages, how mu what percentage of your residents own vehicles? Uh, I would say that at our current villages, we have about, I would say, a quarter-ish have vehicles. So, you know, one site is 20, 20 so five, and another site, or, or sorry, one site's 25, and we have about five vehicles. And then the other site, we have about five vehicles as well, and it's 23. So we have about 10 parking spots in our current configuration between the two villages that people are using. So it is going to be a little tighter for sure um, for parking. Uh, although I don't think that it's going to be drastically different as far as the capacity that we have now. Okay, and there would be no available parking for visitors? Um, no, there would be parking because not everybody's parked there all the time. So um, there are a lot of times where there is available parking, but there might be some times where there isn't. And if there isn't, they will have to find another parking spot that is nearby, but not within the um, gates or within the, the fencing of the, of the perimeter. Great. Thanks for the information. Yep. No problem. Hey, Doug, this is Perry Eskridge from the Realtors. Um, the first question I guess I have is when was the permit application submitted? I, it was sub submitted um, on Friday, May 31st. Okay. So that brings me to my second question, and this is something that a lot of us, well, both in the realtors and the building industry are looking at. I drove through there today, and there are some very significant trees located on that site, or I should say, well, some of them are on the site. The other trees are located in A1 Builders and the Country Club, and... I'm wondering, this might be more of a question for the planners, how does the new landmark tree ordinance fit within all of this? Because I'm almost certain without getting out there and getting a tape measure that those trees are going to be over the 36 inch mark. There's probably at least five or six of them. Thanks, Perry. I can speak to that. So. The city is the property owner of this property, and we do not want to remove any trees. The site plan that Doug showed you retains every single existing tree. It in fact keeps the existing curbing, so it's not even impacting root zones. To get the utilities in there, there's going to be some minor trenching, but it's not going to be in locations that take out any trees. The goal is to keep everything as is. That's why we really like this parking lot, because it had such minimal impacts to vegetation and whatnot. Okay, and where's that trenching going to go? Is it going to go along the side or down the middle or? That's kind of like the second phase in the construction planning. To Doug's point, okay. what we showed you was the preliminary site plan. This is still being refined by project engineers to figure out where exactly that trenching will go. But if you can see along the top left corner, you can make out that that's an existing curb line. So no, no hard right. surface is being ripped out there. And from the preliminary discussions I've had with the city about like where the trenching is gonna go, um, where the electrical is gonna go. So for example, we have like these rows here of houses, right? Um, and again, and they, the, the space between these houses is 11 feet. Uh, and that's in the last layout that I saw that it's all being adjusted. So it's not 100% final, but it's close. And so the, the, the trenching or whatever is going to go like kind of between the rows of these tiny homes where that, where like they'll be plugged in through the back and each one will have its own outlet and, um, and the electrical will go down in these like rows or whatever. And, um, 
and then uh, easily plug into um, each of the units while not affecting any of the existing trees or the other, you know, bushes and stuff that are right nearby. So. Okay, because I mean, I, I have to say my members who are dealing with that ordinance now are like, hmm, I wonder how the city's going to handle this. What are they going to do? Mm, and everybody's yeah. very curious. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, does that make sense what I'm ta- saying about how that It does, happened? yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was just wondering if that all figured in. It, d- it did um, figure in as far as I could tell. Like the, there was discussion about that there was trees that are near the site that fall into that category and that it's not an issue for this layout basically. Cause like we, we, there, there is some trees that are on the site like here, but, the, but they're not being cut down. They're being left up as is. So. Right. Yeah. Well, I didn't think they would be cut down, but I'm, I'm always wondering about the requirement, you know, that, well, it says there's a zone of protection, mm-hmm. no more than 40% of the root zone can be impacted. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm thinking, God, there's a lot of pavement in there on both sides of the trees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. everybody's just really curious about how this devaluation is going to go. You know, who's going to conduct it? How is it evaluated? All of that, because I, I think, you know, as the first sort of test case out the gate, everybody's looking to see, OK, well, if the city allows all that pavement next to a tree, maybe they'll allow us to pave up next to a tree as well. So, I mean, that's that's just where it's all going. Um, There's a bit of a distinction between existing conditions and proposed development. We're not proposing laying any more paving around the trees. Yeah. Um, so I think... It was already present, yeah. 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 But, yeah. you know, when I mean, just in the last four days, I've had eight people come in and tell me, God, we've evaluated these lots and they're damn near unbuildable if the city doesn't give us some massive concessions. And so that's what everybody's watching, right? Is what is, what does this look like on the ground? And, you know, if it doesn't hurt those trees, is it going to hurt on mine? And you know where this is all headed, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, that gets to be the test case. <laughs> I think Perry, if, if you or your real estate community have any specific questions about properties that you're helping homeowners with or prospective buyers, I'll reach out. You can always reach out to the planning staff and we can help you through that because each property is different. Each development proposal is different and this is a new ordinance. So I just yeah. encourage you to keep up that instead, like there's a lot to learn from watching other projects, but I just implore you to make that contact with city staff and, and learn about each individual property and those trees and we can help you. Sure. Also, too, um, I wanted to show you kind of what it does look like. So, for example, our current village, Unity Village, it's actually not as close together. It's not going to be as close together as these ones are, um, but uh, it's still going to be kind of close together. And again, like these are temporary structures, so they can be like moved later if they need to, even though, of course, it's a pain in the ass to move them in a way, but they can be moved. And um, it's not permanently... Uh, affecting the, the the land or the current site as it is um and again this type of use is actually not I, I as far as i'm aware it's actually not allowed under like if you were to you can't like have your own land and then like build a, a permanent tiny home village like what we're doing with the temporary shelter on it um as far as i can tell um under current regulations but it's a uh, I just wanted to show you kind of like what it would look like. Like, so for example, we do have our, um, where's the, well, and I was going to say, you know, from the realtor standpoint, we, we don't really have any concerns about what it looks like, how it's being done. You're you're more concerned about uh, like, Hey, I'm, we're trying to do a project and how do we get this thing through with all this? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, just right out of the shoots, right. This is the neighborhood where the, that, tree ordinance sort of originated and so everybody's very curious <laughs> um the, the question i have for you doug that is probably directly related to tiny home villages okay is two administrations ago several of our realtors approached the city and said hey rather than doing this on an ad hoc piecemeal basis why doesn't the city find a piece of land 
close into town, you know, near services on a bus line mm -hmm. um, that could be sort of a permanent model. And they refer to the Austin project. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, where it's a it's a permanent um, tiny home village. Okay. And the way Austin did it was really kind of cool. They got engineers and architects to come in and have a competition as to who could design the coolest tiny home. And then they got people to sponsor those, build them permanently. And, you know, and then they have an area where people in motor homes and things like that can, I'm, for lack of a better term, I'm going to say camp, although that makes it sound recreational rather than out of necessity. Um, but there was parking spots for RVs. And then there was even tent sites in the back um, where people who were more transient or just, you know, sort of, you know, I, I don't know how you describe this. I, I'm not using the right vernacular, so please forgive me on that. And I get what you're saying, though. Yeah. And I mean, it was just if you if you go and look at the Austin, I think it's called Austin Hope. It is just an amazing project. And I've talked to the city of Ferndale about establishing one of these. And we're working with Ferndale Community Services to, you know, sort of think about where we might be able to do this out here in Ferndale. And I'm wondering, where are you in discussions with the city of coming up with something more like that that is permanent that that has you know permanency for these individuals maybe has more land mm. that allows you to bring in supportive services i mean the austin project has offices for doctors nursing staff social service i mean they've got an employment office there you get mail there there's phones mm. there i mean it's it's designed to get people out of that camp first and foremost, and into more permanent housing. Yeah. And has has that even been approached? Has the has the city expressed a willingness to engage in that discussion? Perry, I can touch on that just a little. Um, so right now, the city has a few different options for, for temporary shelter. It's in that code section I cited, the 2015. When we wrote that, we created the max duration of the five years. Um, we've evaluated that over the years because it's not that old of an ordinance. And one mm -hmm. thing that is being discussed is maybe extending that duration. TBD on that, but what we've realized is, you know, it takes a lot of energy and effort and capital to stand up these villages. It's a huge investment. And to have them only last five years, it can be problematic and it can be, you know, a lot of cost. and. And does it well, really it's disruptive too, you know the other thing in our code is we do allow for interim shelters and we have several throughout town interim shelters mm -hmm. that is that's a use that sticks around i mean it's, people move through it but the use is there i mean think of the mission that's an interim shelter and those are in buildings so you're right we don't really have this like permanent tiny house encampment but it's something that's being discussed. And at the state level, Department of Commerce is working on some draft regulations. I don't know when they'll be done, but the goal is to have a set of kind of a template that cities could use for, for shelter uses. So we don't know what that looks like or when it will come or if we want to use it, but this has been recognized at the state level. I mean, throughout our throughout the Pacific Northwest as an issue that needs to be addressed. And we're constantly learning and refining. And so the wheels are in motion. Um, but I'll, if Tara wants to add in, I'll, I'll let her speak. I do. Um, I do want to differentiate between when, when we use the term permanent. So Perry, you're, I think you were leaning more in the direction of a permanent location for the people that are living there. Well, um, no, I'm actually thinking of more in terms of a development yeah. where the people would move, but the buildings okay. never do. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we, I mean, we are taking that next step right now. The investment that we are making in this village is about $2 million. So that is a, uh, and that includes property. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, and so we are stepping up. We want nicer amenities. Um, you know, I think that when the city supported homes now years ago, we were not anticipating that this crisis was gonna, I think, prevail. We also didn't know if it was a proven model. It's all changed. We think it's a very good model, um, but it is shelter. It's not, we don't view it as a residence. Um, our our hope and goal is that um, the, the guests at the village do move on to permit locations and then we do have building code requirements to stay with under you know something being technically and we don't have the building official here it has to be a certain size um mm -hmm. in order to stay under the building code as a so it's not a residential unit um so but this is i think that i hope the villagers will um appreciate the the new amenities that are that are going to be brought forward um, to do. this village. They do. Um, and it is a significant investment. I will say that also it's more a per, of a permanent model as a residence, not a, a shelter. We are interested in tiny home um, villages if we can find the um, the right piece of property and the right either operator or developer. It is something my team's looking into um, as kind of a next step for people that are interested in independent living, but still have a sense of community. Um, we, we just need, what we're realizing is we need a lot of different options for people. Uh, right now, I think our, our system's built on, on too few of a variety of options for people to choose from. And I'd also like to chime in a little bit too. So um, I want to say that, you know, Homes Now only exists because we are responding to a homelessness and housing crisis, right? So I want to make clear that if everyone was housed and there was no longer any need for sheltering like what we're doing, that um, we wouldn't even need to exist. We are existing as a response to a problem that is there's not enough housing for people. It is a housing crisis. It's a housing affordability crisis as well. And so we provide shelter while people wait to get into any housing that's available. Um, if we grow, it's because the crisis is getting worse. Uh, if, if, we sh if we shrink, the way that that looks is... So many people are getting into housing that we can't keep the villages full. We It'll be half empty because there's just not enough homeless uh, people that need a place to live. Um, but we are far from the opposite of that problem right now. It is, if you look at the numbers, it's getting higher every year, right? And I understand why we're classified as temporary. I get it. Uh, there is a there is some advantage to the temporary because there are certain regulations and codes that you have to follow more so if you're if you are considered permanent. I do think that it would be relatively easy in the municipal code. I mean, this is just my suggest my suggestion as uh, you know somebody that lives in Bellingham uh, working with homelessness. But um, in the current municipal code, it says that it can that a permit can be in there for two years with the opportunity for three subsequent one year extensions. Um, if they just took out the word three and just said subsequent one year extensions, it kind of creates a situation of, yes, it's temporary until it's no longer needed anymore. Um, but it seems like it's gonna be needed for the foreseeable future. And in fact, I think there's gonna be more villages in the future until the housing can get up to capacity and everything like that. And um, and again, it is, it is, for us, it's not necessarily like these are permanent homes for people to live in forever. It's, it's literally our goal is to get people out of homelessness and into actual housing. And this classifies as shelter, not housing. But we try to make the shelter as much like a real housing situation as we can, um, given the um, circumstances. And so, 
you know, you, you, we can get into all kinds of details about it, but when people have their own place, they have their own privacy, they can lock their door, um, they don't have to leave at certain points in the day or whatever. It actually helps get people out of survival mode and able to get that paperwork done and work with their case managers and whoever in order to get into um, actual housing and stuff. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we feel we are still needed at this time to do what we're doing and we're getting, you know, we, we are always trying to get better at what we're doing too. Cause like, you know, we're an all volunteer organization. So really keep that in mind. It's I, I if I keep repeating it, it's just because it's not, it's, it's uh, so unusual. We actually are self-managed, meaning both villages are managed and run by the residents themselves acting in a staff capacity. So, um, we are looking, our main goal, all we're trying to do is to get people housed and sheltered while they're waiting for housing. And so, um, and there's a lot of people that are wanting to be part of the solution to their own problem. And we welcome that. And we are glad that when, that we've been able to do that and that both villages are working together to, um, achieve that. And, uh, we're glad that we've been able to, uh, work with the city to, as a partner to be able to help more people. So, um, just, I'm just reading some of the comments here. Jason says, it's good to hear people are noticing there are limited options. I'm one of those homeless and my experience with the solutions out here may shock you. Uh, Tara says, uh, thank you, Vicki. I, I didn't introduce myself, City of Bellingham Community and Economic Development Director. Uh, I'm in this, I'm the city lead on the Standing Up North Haven. Okay. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to make that part clear that like, I get it why it's temporary technically, but I think there's a way to make it temporary as long until it's no longer needed anymore. But if you were to set up a permanent tiny home village, it might have to be set up a little different where like each, like, let's say like each lot is is the tiny home in like a small yard or something and like maybe people actually own that and they can live there permanently and maybe it has like individual amenities inside each of the units like their own little kitchen and, and, and bathroom and stuff and it would be a little it would be more expensive but it would be more permanent you know but it would open up the door for maybe homeowner people to be homeowners or like you're like get out of the grind of being you know subjected to uh like um rental companies that you know, just keep raising the rent and they're like kind of trapped in that situation. It, you might be able to get out of that situation, but that would be, you know, a different, if we owned our own land, we would try to do something like that as homes now. But currently, you know, we're always on a shoestring budget. So like we've been able, we're, we've done what we can with what we've got to get something going. I guess that would be my input on this discussion. Well, I think just as a final comment, Doug, um, thanks for holding this meeting. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no um, problem. I'm, I'm, I'm actually from the, from the information I'm heard. I, I expected this room to be absolutely packed, but I think that tells you right. A lot of people gripe, but they don't show up. Well, actually, <laughs> so hopefully that's a good sign for you. <laughs> it, it is actually a good sign because we found that when there is actually a lot of gripes and a lot of problems, the attendance is a lot higher. And then when everybody's just kind of like, oh, yeah, they're fine, uh, the attendance is a lot lower. So um, it's not it's not a bad thing that a ton of people ha didn't show up. It's it, I, I'm sometimes and I'm fine, like, right, like I like to to verbally um, like answer everybody's questions or anybody who has concerns or whatever. I've been to a few meetings that were like, uh, I don't mean to swear, but like we're kind of a shit show and have to navigate that and answer people's questions who have very strong concerns. And a lot of times those concerns are based on the fact of what they don't know. So, uh, you know, people fear what they don't know sometimes, right? So what we found was that when we didn't have a track record at all, and we were trying to set up in a neighborhood for the first time, the meetings were packed with a hundred people and everyone had all kinds of concerns and problems. And it wasn't really even based on us, it was based on what they're afraid of it might be, meaning like they're afraid that it might be like, you know, a, a, a trashy homeless camp, or they're afraid that 
um, it'll increase crime or lower their property values or whatever. And, and it's easy to have those fears if you don't, if you haven't seen what we're doing. But now after a couple of years, after people can literally see what we're doing and it's, we're transparent, you can, you can show up unannounced and what you see is what you get and you're not going to have a problem with what you see. Um, that uh, has mostly stopped any kind of people at any of these meetings coming forward to blast us or cause a problem or be uh, fearful of what we're trying to do in their neighborhood. In fact, I think we've, you know, have mostly, um, we've, we've been a positive impact on the neighborhood. Um, that, you know, be, being present in a neighborhood where you have people as a community working together and you have surveillance and stuff like that, it, it actually acts as a deterrent to any of the um, usually negative aspects associated with uh, homelessness um, that people are afraid of in their neighborhood. So, um, you know, I'm just saying that, like, if it's empty, if it's a little empty, it, it, it means that people aren't as concerned. People really show up to these if they're like really concerned or they have like a, a problem or something that they want, they really need to mention. But yeah, or if they're a supporter, they want to support us because, uh, that you know, they've experienced it and they're like, hey, I want to say something or whatever. So yeah, we're doing the best we can. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Samuel? You want to say something? Yeah, sorry. Um, I would also like to, to add on to what you're saying. Um, some of us just show up to know what the heck's going on. <laughs> right, right, yeah, true. Because I, I don't have any concerns or anything, personally. And you, and you do, and you live at Swift Haven, so just let me... Yes, I do. Yeah, okay. Well, um... If there's anything else or there's any questions or whatever I'm really happy to answer them if there's any concerns I'm happy to answer them um, I, we're, we're, we're here for you guys yes we are and just if anybody wanted to add their name and contact information to the chat um, so that you can be included as a party of record again that that is a public record just so you're aware um, but if you feel comfortable doing that you can add it to the chat and Doug can send it my way Okay, uh, I see Perry's, um, but if anybody else wants to add theirs, I can I can add that, and no problem. I'm just opening up a text document here where I can add them. And, uh, okay. Well, thanks so much. Have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. No thanks, problem. Doug. Good to see you all. Yeah, I think we're. we're we might be good to go. So anyway, everyone have a great night and uh, I'm going to post this. So if anybody wants to comment who wasn't here, they can and have a good one. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Sarah. Take it easy. Bye. Bye.